Hey guys, Tim Starnes from Cine Samples. In a previous video, I helped you collaborate with other musicians on a piece of music. In this video, I'm going to share some protocol to help you stay organized while creating music for film or TV. It can be tedious to follow, but if you apply it, it can really save you so many headaches on your next project. If nothing else, this video should cure your insomnia. To help clarify the entire video, here's a table of contents. In this tutorial, I'm focusing specifically on music for film, yet these techniques can be applied anywhere. I'll apologize now if any of this information is obvious or old news to anyone. Hopefully there's at least something in here for everyone. In all of this, I bring my work experience of organizing files and labeling from my music editing on many feature films, including Lord of the Rings. You just cannot survive a film like that without a solid naming protocol. All right, let's talk about the data you receive from editorial. That means the film editor and possibly the music editor. Let's say you've been hired to compose music for a film called The Greatest Film. The editor sends you the most recent version of the film. Here are the possible ways the film might be labeled. In all of these examples, TGF stands for the title of the film, The Greatest Film. The first three examples contain the first reel of the film only. You've got to be pretty old to have worked with an actual reel of film. When films were physically edited on a flatbed or a movieola, the longest reels were a thousand feet, which is approximately 10 to 11 minutes each. After sound was pre-mixed onto these reels, they were joined together in 2,000 foot double reels for the final mix. For examples, reels one and two became reel 1AB. Reels three and four became reel 2AB. Digital editing systems began with 2,000 foot reels, and now systems are powerful enough to contain the entire film in one timeline. Okay, returning to the film file names. In example one, it specifies the third version or the third edit of reel one. Example two specifies that reel one was edited on April 10th, 2020. Example three is the same as example two, only it sorts by the date to reveal the most recent edits. Example four is from an editor who prefers to work with the entire film in one timeline. And it's the third version, which was finished on April 10th, 2020. Let's imagine this scenario. The director asks you to begin by writing a cue somewhere near the beginning of the film that introduces the co-star. You finish the music and you send the director a movie file labeled co-star first draft dot mp4. The director says, I'm not feeling it. Try a different approach, okay? You rewrite it and you send co-star rewrite.mp4. The director then says, better, but please reduce the emotion. Okay, then you send co-star rewrite revised.mp4 and the director asks for a yet another small revision. Then you send co-star rewrite final.mp4 thinking this must be it, this is it. But the director asks for yet another revision and so you send co-star rewrite final revised. The director says, wait, wait, I prefer two versions ago. What? Which one is it? Co-star rewrite revised or co-star rewrite? So you see, it's getting pretty messy and confusing really fast. Did you label your logic sessions the same as the movie files you delivered to the director? What if the editor re-edits the scene you just composed? How are you going to label your conformed version? By the way, conforming music to a scene that has been edited is re-editing the music in such a way to retain musicality and the composer's intention. And what if the director asks for a co-star variation piece of music in Reel 3? You need to establish a solid naming convention specially customized for your music in the film. The spotting notes are the director's musical instructions for the film. The spotting session is a meeting early on with the director, composer, editor, and sometimes the music editor. Everyone watches the entire film as the director describes when music should begin and end and what is required of the music in each scene. You should make a video recording of the meeting or at least an audio recording and then transfer the notes into either Word, Excel or a Google Doc and refer to them during the entire post-production process. Even after several film re-edits, most of the director's initial musical intentions will remain the same. After the spotting session, you'll have a list of separate pieces of music within the film, also known as cues. Each cue needs a numeric label that will sort chronologically from the top to the end of the film. Let's say, for example, there are 36 cues of music in a film. There are a few methods for labeling them. Find out which one works for you. 
The 1M1 method is the most traditional method. It labels the first music cue in the film 1M1, which simply means the first music cue in reel 1, M standing for music. 3M2 would be the second music cue in reel 3. A variation of this method allows the second number to continually increment throughout the film. For example, if there are nine cues in reel 1, they would be labeled 1M1 through 1M9. If there are seven cues in reel 2, they would begin from 2M10 through 2M16, and so forth. Then perhaps the cues in the final reel, which is reel 5, might be 5M30 through 5M36. The downside to this method results from rebalancing reels. Rebalancing reels comes from a re-edit. If reel 1 becomes shorter, the first scene in reel 2 could move into the end of reel 1. And therefore, a 2M1 cue could end up in reel 1, which is a little confusing. The scene method. Another method is to label the cues to match the scene numbers in the screenplay. This method is more relatable to the director and the editor. The downside is the possibility that the director and editor decide to swap scenes out of chronological order. Or you could simply give each cue a number. 1 through 36, for example. This method could also suffer from swapping scenes in editorial, which is another great reason to keep a music log. The music log is a summary of key information about each cue in the film. Make this into a Google Doc so that everyone on the music production team, from the composer, music editor, music prep team, synthestrators, recording engineers, etc., can be updated as changes happen. If scene 33, for example, is moved before scene 32, your music log can reflect that. There is a terminology difference between music log and cue sheet. Many people mistakenly use the term cue sheet to mean a music log. A cue sheet is a document submitted to PROs, performance rights organizations, after the end of a project. They outline the pieces of the music in a film or a TV show with writing and publishing information. Though it may have similarities to the information on a music log, they are not the same. The music log is used during music production, and the cue sheet is the end summary. Here is a basic example of a music log. The most essential data in the log are the cue number, the title, the duration, the version of the film it fits, and its start time within that film. The film's frame rate is super important, and that's global. You should create all your sessions in that same frame rate. Connect with the editor. Find out what frame rate he or she is working. If your film editor is working at a frame rate of 24 frames per second, for example, then create all of your sessions with that same frame rate. Also, the editor's audio sample rate is not 44.1 kilohertz. No one is burning CDs anymore, so create all your files and sessions at 48 kilohertz, or if you really want to get fancy, 96. 48 kilohertz is the most common sample rate when working in film or television. You can customize the music log to fit your needs on any project. For example, columns can be added for the demos that you deliver to the director. You can also add columns with checklists or colors to indicate the status of each cue, whether it's approved or it needs to be revised or needing conformed, composed, recorded, mixed, etc. Okay, let's move on to file naming protocol. During the music production process, you'll generate a vast amount of data in different types. Files from your DAW, whether it be Logic, Cubase, DP, or Pro Tools. Audio files, movie files, MIDI files, scores, parts, etc. It's really important to use the same file name for all files that reference the same version of the same queue. The only difference would be the extension. This provides a clear chronological way to sort them. So let's return to the CoStar Q example from before. According to the spotting notes, the Q is 1M7 with a start time of 01, 16, 45, 10. The first attempt could be labeled TGF 1M7 V1 R1 2004-10.mp4. That would be the video that you sent to the director. This shows that it was written to the real one edit from April 10th. Your DAW file could be named exactly the same, the subsequent revisions could easily be V2 and then V3. And the director can easily say, hey, I prefer V2. And then set V2 in the music log, add the start time and duration, and check approved. Let's say the editor requests an audio-only version of your music for this cue. Then the start time can go into the audio file name. This tells the editor which version of the film and what time code to place the WAV file. 
Let's say the editor changes Reel 1 and sends you a new Reel 1, labeled 418. The co-star intro scene, 1M7, has changed, so you conform the music. The new session becomes TGF 1M7 V2C with the new date, for example. You might use the letter C to indicate the cue has been conformed. And then the new audio file might be the same with the new timecode. This file name reflects the new start time as well as an internal edit to the music. Or perhaps the co-star scene was not re-edited, but scenes prior to that were shortened and 1M7 only has a new start time. The file name then could go without the C, but definitely include the timecode start time in the file name. Maybe it would help you to add a column to the music log to indicate the original reel of film to which each cue was written. So in conclusion, modify your file name and the music log for composition revisions with the V number and change of start time or a re-edit with a new reel number and date, new time code, and perhaps adding a C if there were internal music edits. Modify the music log for delivery to director and editorial, approval, revisions needed, conforms needed, and if the queue is ready for scores and parts. As I said before, you can add columns for any criteria that you might need. All right, let's talk about folder structure. You're starting to accumulate lots of data and you need a clear way to organize it. The best method is whatever works for you and your project. And here are a few suggestions. Let's start by creating a master folder for this film project. We'll call it the greatest film. Now inside that, create a folder for important documents for the film. We'll call it docs. And inside that docs folder, I'm going to create spotting and review notes. And inside that folder, I'm going to create the date and spotting of the spotting session date. And that will contain video, audio, any Word, Excel, or other documents from the spotting session. Also inside spotting and review notes folder, I can create subsequent folders for any review notes from the director based on the date. For example, 200413 review, if there are review notes from April 13th. Also inside docs, you might make folders for your composing contract, musician contracting, studio contracting, etc. Whatever you need. Going back to the root folder, the greatest film, create another folder called from editorial. And inside that, create another folder called film. And inside that folder, create folders for each date that you receive film edits from the editor. For example, the April 10th folder will contain the Reel 1 from April 10th and any other Reels that were finished on that day. The April 18th folder will contain the re-edit of Reel 1 on April 18th. Also inside the From Editorial folder, create a music folder. This will contain any edits the editor or music editor may have made for review demonstration. This might also contain source music that goes into the film. Here's a pro tip. Consider putting the film folder on a separate volume to save system resources. For example, your samples might be streamed from an SSD on your internal ATA bus. Then your project drive might be on the USB bus. And your film might be on a drive connected to the Thunderbolt bus or the PCIe bus. Okay, going back to the root folder, create a logic folder for all of your sessions. And inside logic folder will be a folder for each queue. 1M7, for example. And inside 1M7 will contain several logic files, one for each revision and or conform of that queue. Then you might create a folder called underscore old, and you can move all of the older unused sessions into there for neatness. This folder sorts to the very top for convenience. Going back to the root folder, create a two director folder. And inside that, a folder for each queue as well. Inside each of these will be the movie files that you've delivered for review. Copy these movie files from your logic folders. Yes, this takes up more hard drive space, but this is a great way to keep track of what the director has. Going back to the root folder, create a two editorial folder, and inside that, a folder for each queue. Inside those will be all of the audio that you've sent to the editor. Again, you're gonna be copying this from your logic folders, but it's also a great way to keep track of exactly what the editor has. Going back to the root folder, you might create any folder to whomever with Q folders inside those. Say, for example, for orchestrators or copyists or synthestrators, etc. If you're doing the music prep yourself, you can create scores and parts folder under the root folder and then a folder for each Q inside that. 
As I told you in the beginning, this is very tedious and a little difficult to wrap your head around, but if you're still running this video, you're probably asleep by now. Anyway, I hope this has helped in some way to get you more organized on your next project.